All right. Welcome to week five. Uh, we are going to be covering. Otherwise, if he's on camera, I have to get written permission. Okay. So, welcome to week five. Topic is going to be normalization. At the end of today's lecture, we will have all the content for the midterm. There is no new content after today before the midterm in two weeks. Next week's going to be a quick review. I might do another one of these normalization type examples just so that because it's a topic that people struggle with. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're pretty much there now. So without further ado, oh, one other thing, you will notice that the slide deck that I'm using today is slightly different than what's on Brightspace. I trimmed off the back end of the one that's, the one that's on Brightspace has more slides than the one I'm going to use today because I trimmed off the back bit because I'm going to use a different example in class. So the slide deck that's on Brightspace has a different example in it. So it'll be good for you guys to have, you know, version two of these examples. Um, the example I'm going to using, be using for the presentation today is one I've used for a long time. Thus, it comes very clear and there's less uh, weirdness in the delivery. And this is not on. Hang on, let's try that again. There we go. So what we are going to go for today, uh, normalization, just so you know, uh, in a quick and dirty phrasing, is a technique or a process to make sure that your database structures are, for lack of a better term, sane. Insane in the sense that it is safe to work with, uh, it does not cause problems elsewhere, um, it's broken down to its smallest component pieces kind of thing to avoid things called anomalies. Um, some people call it a tool. There's a few different things. So normally normalization, there's two sides to normalization. There's the, the end goal of what it should be. And then there's the, hey, somebody gave you a big pile of crap and you need to clean it up. Um, often, hey, it happens. You don't as much nowadays as you used to, but it still happens where you will be given a big pile of unnormalized data and then your boss says, I want to be able to query this or we want to incorporate this into what we have and you have to work with that data. And sometimes we'll receive one, two, three or four or more tables that has existing data in it. It might come to you as an Excel spreadsheet, it might come to you as a CSV file or a bunch of CSV files. It might come to you as a database dump from one system. So how the data arrives to you is irrelevant. It's what you do with said data. Um, and, you know, there's a question here, should the data be stored as received or should you transform it for storage? Uh, it's kind of a trick question because unless the data comes to you in a good condition, you're always going to want to clean it up before you put it in, right? So you want your data to be as clean and as lean as possible before you put it in your database to avoid future problems. So here's our good old definition, because normalization is more of a theoretical concept that has practical applications. Instead of being a practical application that has a bunch of theory tied to it. Um, so normalization is a process that allows you to organize data into tables and columns. Okay, it sounds a lot like database design. Well, it is, it's part of that process. However, the concept is that a database table should be about a specific topic, also known as an entity, and only those columns that belong to that topic and or entity are in that table. So sometimes you'll receive a big dump of data that has information about three or four different things in it. The goal is that you take those three or four different things you break it down into its smaller component pieces so each one can live on its own. So an example here is a spreadsheet containing information about salespeople and customers can serve several purposes. It could identify the salespeople, it could list all the customers. Um, you could identify which salespeople call on which specific customers. Um, it 
could be a mess. So when you limit a table to a single purpose, a topic, entity, whatever, basically your table is about a single thing, whether it's a person, an event, whatever. Um, it avoids data duplication. Um, and it avoids things coming from database modification. In other words, not changing the structure, but changing the data. And in order to achieve those objectives, there's rules that were written out years and years and years ago. Um, and then they coined a bunch of terms to, you know, describe their rules, because I guess at one point they didn't have the terms to describe these rules, right? When you don't know how to describe something, you take a bunch of words and use it to describe it. Um, that's basically it, right? I mean, this in the 1970s, when these rules were created, they didn't have a frame of reference, so they came up with terminology to help describe it. And then they said, these are the words. Here's the description of what these words mean. Figure it out. The good news is, is I'm going to you know, explain it to you. Um, so basically, when you're normalizing, there's certain stages, and those st no, those stages are known as the normal forms. So a normal form, it's not all database tables, relations, entities are equal. Some are easy to process. Some are problematic. Um, the the different um, relations or you know entities are categorized into normal forms based depending what kind of problems they have. And um, once you understand what the normal forms do, it'll help you create decent database design. And there, the three, there's three normal forms that most databases is designed for. So when you're designing a database, whether from scratch or you're coming in with existing data or whatever else, um, what is usually considered proper is if a database is what's called in the third normal form. So you want to go from first to second to third. Once you're in third, most issues are resolved. There's still potential issues, but most issues are resolved. And usually it's a good place to stop. Uh, there are edge cases which cover higher normal forms, um, which I'm covering one level past third today. Uh, but there's fourth, fifth, sixth, and then there's like three other named ones after that. But honestly, after you get past the fourth normal form, it's all pocket protector land, uh, where a bunch of people, universities needed to justify their PhD. So they invented edge cases to now create new normal forms. They go, yeah, if you have this specific edge case, that could happen once in 20,000 designs. You need to use normal form six to fix it. All right. So why would you normalize? There's three reasons to normalize. The first one is actually one of the most important ones. It's to minimize duplicate data. You don't want to change things in more than one place. Again, modern computers are fast. Modern hard drives are insanely fast. Like literally, like the hard drive in this laptop is faster than the RAM was in my first PC. Let's just think about that for a second, right? Literally, the physical storage on this machine is faster than the RAM in my first 386 computer that I got in like 91. So, you know, hard drives are like solid state storage has gotten really fast. But which means that when you're dealing with duplicate data, it's going to get processed a lot faster than it used to. But back in the day, having to uh, deal with duplicated data was dangerous. Okay, so I'm sure some of you have seen movies where, you know, they have big computers and there's like tape to tape and the tape's moving back and forth. So imagine if you had to modify the same data multiple places, that means the tapes are being moved back and forth. That means the updates are going to be slow. The tapes would break and they'd have to be fixed. And then when it's broken part way through, suddenly you've got inconsistent data. Second, is to minimize or avoid data modification issues. I'll be going through those in a few minutes. And the third is to simplify queries. Um, when you learn about SQL after the break, uh, you'll know, you'll understand what I'm talking about queries. But 
let's start with uh, the quick little example at the bottom of this slide. Um, it's not been normalized. So we're going to discuss a few of the problems that's in it. Um, so you will notice that you've got an employee ID, salesperson, sales office, office number, customer one, customer two, customer three, and you got some data, you got some gaps in the data. There's a variety of things in there. Uh, some of this data, you'll notice that, um, you know, the office numbers are duplicated and, you know, sales office is duplicated, that kind of stuff. So in this table, which I'll have to flip back and forth, is you'll notice that they defined a primary key, so an identifier, and they underlined it, so employee ID. Great. The first thing to notice is that this table serves many purposes. It identifies the sales reps right here, right? It's employee ID and salesperson. It lists the sales offices and those numbers. So there's the sales office and the phone number for the office. And it lists each salesperson's customers. Now, whenever a table serves more than one purpose, it adds a lots of challenges. Um, have any of you ever tried to do two things at the same time? Like literally tried to do two things at the same time? I was actually gonna say, uh, have you ever tried chopping vegetables and answering your 22 doll 22 year old daughter's questions? It doesn't go well, right? Either you, your hands stop moving or you stop talking or you end up cutting yourself, right? So what the problem is with data is the same thing is when a table tries to do too many things at the same time, it has its own set of problems. It could have data duplication where you keep duplicating the same stuff. If we look back, you will notice that the sales office is duplicated. That's not good. That means that let's say we need to change the phone number for the Chicago office. We need to change it twice. Yeah, in three rows of data, that's nothing. But if it's 10 million rows of data, it's a little bit more something. There's uh, data update issues, which was exactly what I just referred to, where if I need to change the phone number, you're going to have a problem because you got to do it more than one place. It's going to make looking things up more complicated. Because if I want to look stuff up by the sales office or by the sales rep, I'll always end up with a mix mash of data. Same thing with the way the customers are listed, one, two, three. Not all the sales reps have three customers. So suddenly we have an inconsistent number of customers going sideways. What happens if suddenly a sales rep's really good, so we decide to give them a fourth? We can't because of the way they designed the table. So. Duplicated information has two problems. It takes up more room, obviously, and it decreases performance. Because if you need to keep writing the same stuff over and over again, it's going to take longer. How many people here have had to write lines when they were bad in school? Okay, at least some of us are old enough to actually have been tortured with that. Okay? It takes a long time to keep writing those lines over and over and over again, right? Especially when it's your third time you get busted. <laughs> You're sitting at a thousand lines. Yeah. So it takes room because they got to waste the space to write those lines. It takes time to keep duplicating the same stuff. Therefore, it takes up storage and it, increases, it decreases performance because it's constantly having to do the same thing over and over again. And it suddenly becomes more difficult to maintain data changes. Back to my example of writing lines as a kid. On page three, you suddenly realize you made a mistake and you have to fix all your other lines because they're not gonna accept them the way they are. That's gonna be a lot of work too, so it makes maintaining the data more difficult. Now, in the database, maintaining the data is a different kind of problem, but the concept is roughly the same idea. If we need to go and change the data it's gonna be more difficult because what happens if, let's just say in this table, we are searching for the for the sales office. How do we know which one's actually the primary key? Is it the phone number or is it the city it's in? We don't know. So let's say we want, we're searching for the off, by the office by the name. 
So Chicago and Chicago, but suddenly they realized that that's not going to be in Chicago anymore. They decided to move it out of Chicago to a smaller place so that they have to pay less rent. So you're searching for offices by Chicago. You update the first one, great. Then you got to go find the second one, great. Third one, great. And suddenly your computer crashes. You go back and now your data is inconsistent. So the sales information is duplicated for each sales rep. The office number gets duplicated, potentially other things. So that's just funny because I, I forgot that this slide even said that. So modification anomalies. Consider where we want to move the Chicago office to Evanston instead. Um, the problem is that to reflect that in the table that we have it, we have to update the entries for all the salespeople already in Chicago, which means we got to change it in more than one place. Two rows, it's nothing. 10 million rows, it's something. Um, and in view of larger tables, this could potentially involve hundreds of updates. Um, I actually have a perfect example of that today uh, at work. I received an, an alert from our Amazon resources where one of our databases suddenly was having a, a moment let's say. Um, essentially, there's an alert set that if the database server reaches 70% utilization for more than five minutes, it sends me an email say, things have gone horribly wrong. One of the other developers thought it was clever to uh, process a large batch job, constantly rewrote the same records over and over and over again. So this database server normally sees, you know, 100 queries a second. It was hitting 5,000 queries a second. Therefore, he was constantly rewriting the same stuff because he was working with unnormalized data and he didn't take the time to normalize it before he shoved it into, the good news was not the production database, but that's not the point. And so the server spiked. And if you don't know anything about how Amazon works is you pay per CPU time. The more CPU you use, the more you pay for your database. The disk space costs nothing. It's pennies on the, you know, pennies. CPU usage on the other hand, he probably cost us 50 bucks. Right out of nowhere, 50 bucks doesn't sound like much for a corporation, but do it enough times, it starts to add up. Um, so let's turn around with the other kind of anomaly where if John Hunt quits, so if we go back right here, see John Hunt, and I'll actually decide not to exclude these people. See John Hunt right here. If John Hunt quits and we delete his record, we're gonna lose the fact that the New York office even exists. That's known as a deletion anomaly. So a deletion anomaly happens when you delete data from a database and you lose data that's not directly related to whatever it is you're deleting. You fire a person and you lose the fact that you had an office in New York. Those two things aren't really related. The employee and the office are not related, but because of the way this is structured, we will lose that person. Okay. So those are known as modification anomalies. There are three kinds of modification anomalies, insert, update, and delete. So an insertion anomaly. So essentially the way an insertion anomaly works is if you have to add data to a table, but to be able to add it, you have to add something else. So Back to our happy little salesperson table. We decided we we're gonna open up a new office in Atlanta. Fantastic. Sounds like a good plan, except the fact that with the current structure, we can't add an Atlanta office unless we already have an employee for Atlanta. So, you know, the big wigs suddenly decide we're gonna open up an office in Atlanta. They go shopping for some real estate. They lease an office space. They go to add it to their system and they can't because they don't actually have anybody working there yet. Therefore, we need to create an employee to be able to even have an office in Atlanta. But how can you have an office in Atlanta if you don't have an employee for the office in Atlanta, right? We're stuck chicken before the egg. Bad things happen. A modification anomaly. So if we need to update information in more than one row, I already covered that one, you know, you got to change Chicago. You want to change the phone number, you got to change it in multiple places. 
for like I said, two rows, it's nothing. A million rows, it's something. And apparently we're going to skip deletion anomaly, but that one we covered already when we talked about, you know, firing John Hunt from New York. Uh, if we get rid of John Hunt, we lose the New York office, and that's a deletion anomaly. All right, so now we roughly understand the concept of the anomalies. In other words, anomalies are when you either create data unnecessarily, you have to modify data in more than one place unnecessarily, or if you delete something, you lose data that's unrelated. So that's the plain English of the three anomalies. So there's, here's, remember earlier I was talking about how they had to come up with terminology to explain the normal forms? Well, here's the first one. It's called functional dependencies. A functional dependency happens when the value of one or a set of attributes determines the value of a second set of attributes. All right, so cookie cost is equal to the number of boxes times five bucks. Therefore, the number of boxes determines the cookie cost. So the attribute on the left side of the functional dependency is called the determinant. So number of boxes determines the cost. And by the way, this is a really stupid example but it's one that's fairly understandable at a first pass um, because nobody ever use number of boxes as a determinant. But as a starting point, it's a good place to start. Um, trust me, as a person, I used to go door to door with my daughter selling Girl Guide cookies. If I had to tr keep the number of boxes as the unique way of how I sold the, how she sold, sorry, how she sold, I didn't sell them how she sold the boxes, uh, I would end really fast after the first house because everybody buys one or two boxes. Um, so when we look at this uh, verbiage or this notation, it's basically saying that the number of boxes determines the cost. So that's what that means. Um, functional dependencies might be based on an equation. So Quantity, extended price is equal to the quantity times the unit price. So again, let's go back to Loblaws and we're going to buy ourselves some bananas. Um, 79 cents a pound, we have two pounds. So let's round it to 80 cents because 79 cents sucks to multiply. 80 cents times two is a buck 60 for your bananas. The buck 60 is determined by the fact that it's 80 cents times two, which would be notate, noted as follows. Quantity and unit price determines the extended price. That is a functional dependency. Realistically, what that means in that practice though, is that attributes depend on another attribute. That's the simple version of it. So functional dependencies are not equation. So there's, the good news is for you guys, um, you're not being forced to learn something called relational algebra. You could take an entire term of just that topic. Um, there are textbooks where, you know, there's chapters dedicated to relational algebra. Somebody decided to create an entire field of mathematics just to explain how things relate to other things. Um, so the thing is though, that functional dependencies are not equations. If we look at object color, weight, and shape. So you'll notice that the object color determines the weight, the object color determines the shape, Therefore, the object color determines weight and shape. It's not an equation. It's, it's a notation. So an equation actually does math. A notation is just a way of writing things. So, so far, I've just been showing you how to write some of this notation. So this is known as a composite functional dependency, the last example. So it's when there's multiple determinants that determine a functional dependency. And when I do the example at the end, this will all make sense. Take my word for it, there's a lot of theoretical stuff at the front, and then it makes more sense when you actually see it in practice. But unfortunately, you gotta see the word, you gotta hear the words and see the words. 
um, before you can. All right, so a composite determinant is a determinant that consists of more than one attribute. This one's actually going to be a little closer to how you guys would actually realize this. So you got a student number and a class number determines the grade. So you have a student number, you've got a course section number. That determines, you know, your grade as far as access is concerned. So here are the rules. If A determines B and C, then A determines B and A also determines C. That is a decomposition rule. In other words, you're going to take a rule and you're going to break it down. So if A determines B and C, that means A determines B and it determines C. The If A determines B and A determines C, then obviously the opposite is A determines B and C. So that's known as the union rule. Um, however, if A and B determines C, that means that neither A or B determines C by itself. Okay, so going back to that first line at the top, which is the last rule at the bottom, a student number by itself does not determine a grade. A class number by itself does not determine the grade. Student plus class allows you to determine the grade. That combination of the two allows you to set a grade. On the other hand, I could go with student number determines student name, student email. That'd be a case of A determines B and C. Class number might have room and time. So therefore, class number might determine B and C again. However, A and B are needed for C. For in other words, student number and class number determine the grade. All right, so when are determinant values unique? A determinant is unique in a relation if and only if it determines every other column in the relation. In other words, remember how up till now we talked about keys? Yes. Yes and no. The, a determinant becomes an identifier, which becomes a primary key. So. Normalization is the very beginning. So right at the beginning, we don't know what the identifiers are, so we worry about things that determine other things. So we worry about the determinants. Eventually, the determinants become identifiers, which will then become keys. So it's way back, you know, in the primordial ooze right now, you know, there's not even things with legs walking around yet. But these things are still determining other things. That's what we're doing right now is we're going to discuss. Yes, that's exactly where it becomes. That's where it comes from. Eventually. Once it evolves. No, no, no. The candidate K. A determinant becomes a candidate key, and a candidate key can becomes identifier. The identifier becomes a primary key. So one is normalization, one is conceptual, one is logical, one is physical. Hey, how do you ride a bicycle? Yeah, but how do you get on your bike? How do you lift your leg over the side? There's all kinds of steps, right? It's the same thing with computers, even more so. There you go. I've had this argument before. Can you tell? <laughs> it makes sense once you step back and you look at the big picture. The problem is that we're showing it to you piece by piece, so you're having a hard time seeing how the different pieces. Next week, after the review, because it's going to be a very short review, I'm actually going to go through right from normalization all the way to a physical diagram, so you see the whole thing. Start to end. So next week is when I I paint the entire picture. And I'm actually going to make my own canvas after roughing up some cotton. I'm going to stretch it out, bleach it, the whole step, like literally step by step, the whole thing. It takes about an hour for me to show you guys everything. Unfortunately, I got to show you all the steps first. Okay. So a determinant is unique in a relationship if and only if it determines every other column in a relationship. Again, 
Using the example, the student number identifies a person's name and email address. The student number determines both of those. It doesn't determine the person's grade. It determines both of those. Okay, so you cannot find the determinants of all functional dependencies simply by looking at unique values in one column. At first, you'll look at it and go, man, yeah, this is pretty good. However, depending on what you've been given, you might have some limitations. You might not have all the information you need. So there's some uh, data set limitations. In other words, they gave you an example of 100 rows. Probably good enough, but maybe it's not. Um, it must also be logically a determinant. For a student, the student number is a good determinant because it determines the rest. A person's first name is probably not a good determinant. I'm sure there's at least two people in this room that have the same first name or at least the same first name phonetically. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember people's names. But there's, there's probably a good chance that, you know, usually a safe bet is that there's more than one Daniel in the room because that's a pretty common name. So a determinant must be lo a logical choice. It could be something that becomes an identifier later. In other words, it could be a SIN number or an email address or a student number. The thing is, is you try to find what will work as a determinant. Well, it, so sometimes you're going to be given a pile of data and it's going to be really obvious. Sometimes they'll give you some data. They'll give you like five rows, 10 rows saying, this is what our data looks like. And looking at that, you might not be able to find the identifier. There might be a combination of columns that help identify things. So you end up trying to figure out the combination. So the example I'm going to do at the end is going to show you guys all the steps for this. All right. So relations are categorized in normal form based on which modification anomalies or other problems they are subject to. So now we're going to go back to summarizing the theory. So right now we're really only going to worry about first, second, and third normal form. I am going to touch on something called Boyce Cod, BCNF. So essentially, we are going to worry about functional dependencies. Because for 95 to 98% of database design, resolving functional dependencies will resolve pretty much every problem you're going to have. So it fixes first, second, and third normal form. Boyce Cod is the not the fourth normal form, as you'll notice, because fourth normal form is below. Um, in the industry, we tend to refer to that as normal form three and a half. Because three and a half is faster than saying boys cod or something. It's faster to write, at least. So essentially, in the boys cod normal form, which I'll talk about later, it's basically that the principle of boys cod is that um, everything depends on the key and only the key. That's summarized in plain English. Uh, fourth, fourth normal form worries about multi-value dependencies. Um, fifth normal form, DKNF, um, deals with data constraints and oddities. I'm not even going to even finish reading that last point because I'm not going to talk about it past this slide. So there's no point. It's not going to be on the test either. All right. So a few basic guiding points to normalization. Uh, you read the business rules carefully. You only do one step at a time. In other words, you don't try to jump to third normal form right away. Um, even as a person, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. And whenever I receive data, uh, I'll you know be a little lazy and I'll try to jump to third normal form right away. And then it comes back to bite me in the back end um, because I'm rushing through the job. And realistically, if I took an extra 20 minutes, I probably wouldn't have those problems but we're all busy. Um, so you may end up drawing a dry diagram up front, but here are the four key points of normalization. You're not going to add any data. In other words, you're not going to create synthetic keys while you're normalizing. You add nothing. You don't remove data because the point of normalization is to have something that's sane and works, not because you just want to eliminate pieces. You're not going to add any extra attributes. You're not going to eliminate any attributes. So in other words, we are not going to add new attributes to make things fit. 
we're not going to take attributes out to make things work because if we take out attributes, we lose data. If we add attributes, we're creating data. So imagine I went suddenly I went to this room and go, oh, I got this big list of student names. Last name doesn't work, so let's get rid of last names. Nobody in here has a last name anymore. Great. But that's not how it works. So when you're normalizing, the rule is add nothing, take nothing away. Work with what you're given. Try, not during normalization. That happens later. Normalization, the goal is you want to break things down to its smallest component pieces without adding or removing anything because the process should be reversible. In other words, if you have normalized database, you decide, oh, this is kind of stupid. I need to get back a little bit. You should be able to rewind the work. Uh, there are cases that you don't want some normalization, and I'll explain those in a bit. All right. Finally, now we're going to get to the proper definitions. First, normal form. So for first normal form, it means that the information is stored in a table. In other words, you know, picture an Excel spreadsheet, an HTML table, whatever. And each column contains atomic values. In other words, each column contains a single value. By atomic value, that means it contains, if the column is about a person's first name, it only has a person's first name. If it has an email address, it contains one and only one email address. That's what atomic means. In other words, that piece cannot be broken down into smaller pieces, reasonably speaking. Um, there are no repeating groups of columns. So the example I'm going to have, what I'm going to do with you guys, has an example of repeating groups of columns. Um, so the, the columns are atomic. There's no repeating groups of columns. Um, and it has a defined primary key. So we've identified a primary key, also known as a determinant. Could be multi-column, compound key. But at this point in time, we're not creating anything new. So one, two, three column, whatever it takes, you're going to identify that. So that's the first normal form. The second normal form happens when, if it's in first normal form, because just like in Dragon B, you can't become a Super Saiyan unless you're a Saiyan first, because that's just not how it works. You cannot jump to level two unless you're already at level one. And all non-key attributes are determined by the entire primary key. So this is known as a partial dependency. And I really hate that slide with that alphabet soup on it. So if we look at the bottom, the example right here, the activity determines the fee. The student ID has nothing to do with the fee for the activity. It's just the activity. Therefore, that's known as a partial dependency. The activity fee depends on activity, but not on student ID. Therefore, that is a partial dependency. It depends on part of the key. And that relation that we have defined right here, we have a compound key, right? Student ID and activity. But the activity fee only depends on the activity. Okay. How many of you have kids? How many of you have put kids in daycare and or summer camp? I've done it. God, it cost a lot of money. It costs the same price for my kids as it did for my neighbor's kids. Therefore, it's not my kid that determines the price of the fee. It's whatever camp they're being put in that determines the cost of the fee. Therefore, the student ID doesn't determine the fee, just the activity. Therefore, that's known as a partial dependency. That attribute or piece of data only depends on part of the key. In other words, it's a partial dependency. It only depends on part of the determinant. So. That's why I just skipped on the alphabet soup because that alphabet soup is totally not understandable. 
that is in the textbook exactly like that, by the way. So whenever you decide to go read through the textbook, you'll see examples with a bunch of alphabet soup in it. Third normal form. You cannot be in third normal form unless you are in second normal form. That's just how it works, right? And there are no non-key attributes determining another non-key attribute. So this one is really hard to understand. At first, when I do the example, it'll be a lot clearer. So when a attribute depends on another attribute, and that attribute is determined by a third attribute, that's known as a transitive dependency. In other words, to be able to determine the final value, you have to transit through another attribute. So you go attribute one to attribute two to attribute three, because you're transiting through an attribute that's known as a transitive dependency. Remember earlier when I was talking about how the guys who came up with the stuff invented phrases and used a bunch of words to try to explain concepts? This is the bunch of words. Okay, so <laughs> ignoring the alphabet soup, I like the example they've got there a lot better. So we have something called student housing. So in student housing, um, we have the student ID, the building, and the building fee. And right now, assuming that the student ID is the determinant, in other words, the primary key, the building fee is determined by the building. Building is determined by the student ID. So the building fee is determined by the building. It has nothing to do with the student ID at all. Therefore, but as it currently stands and defined, the student ID determines the building, which also determines the building fee. Therefore, to get the building fee from student, we have to transit through the building. So we got to go, this depends on this, which depends on that. The second you say, this depends on this, which depends on that, it's a transitive dependency. We have to get rid of those to be in third normal. Trust me, it'll make more sense when you see the example. Okay, so voice cod. Actual fact, you know what? I'm going to come back to voice cod after my example. Hang on, there's lots of slides about voice cod. Okay, here's my example. Wow, that's small. Um, I'm going to be writing on the board with all my colorful markers. All right, so. For starters, when we look at the slide, this is not considered a proper relation. Although we did identify our determinants, or in other words, our candidate key, our primary key, or our candidate key, which we've underlined, you'll notice right here that we have these blocks of empty space right here. That's because this chunk over here is known as a repeating set of columns. It's a repeating group of columns. So for order 1006, we have three products in it. Because we have these empty blocks, it's not a proper relation because we cannot retrieve each of those rows independently. So to make it quick and easy to understand, which of course it got even smaller, um, you just fill out the entire block. So in other words, we just took the top, we copied it down, and we brought it across, and now we have this. Okay, so I'm probably gonna have to turn on a light on the screen, aren't I? I apologize for my handwriting now. Okay, let's call this entity order. And here we have order ID, order date. I am going to abbreviate these column names because I don't have a lot of room. Um, customer ID, customer name. Customer address, 
then we got product ID. Product description. Product finish. Product price and quantity. There, I got it to fit on the board. Okay, so we know that so far we've identified that our primary key is those two pieces because that's the scenario we've got. All right, now. Before I get any further, we're just going to identify a few anomalies in here. We need to change. Oh, even better. Okay. See the this last order one zero zero seven. Um, Furniture Gallery in Boulder, Colorado, decides they didn't want to order four dressers. They just don't want that dresser anymore. So that line gets deleted. We lose the fact that oak is even a finish. So that's a deletion anomaly. So if we delete this row of data, we lose the fact that we can, things are oak. Um, we need to, again, uh, Furniture Gallery decides they want to order another uh, writer's desk. If we want to add the writer's desk in here again, we need to duplicate the writer's desk and duplicate all the customer information. That's an insertion anomaly where even though we just want to add another order line, we're duplicating data because we won't be able to retrieve the records. And the update anomaly is we want to suddenly change the price for, uh, whatever this is, the S Entertainment Center from 650 to 700 bucks because the price of the wood has gone up. Therefore, if we want to update the price, we have to do it in two places. It's not great. So these are the anomalies. The goal is we don't want to have these problems anymore. Therefore, we're, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sit there and try to find things that are fully dependent. And when we look at this, we know that the quantity, if nothing else, is fully dependent on the entire primary key. And this marker is dying. I mean, I've had these markers since before we went away for COVID. So they're a little old. Um, I'm going to put up a legend right over here. Okay, so this is technically first normal form. Yay for us. Mm -hmm. I think I lift the, that you're not going to see the one and F anymore on that side, but you know. Okay, so one and F. <clears throat> now the next thing we have to identify is the partial dependencies. So again, the definition of a partial dependency is a dependency that depends on only part of the key. So I'm going to do it in orange. So right now, we know for a fact that some of this is a partial dependency. The price, the finish, and the description are dependent only on the product ID. Because when we looked at that data over here, you'll notice that four determines the description, the finish, and the price. Because it, if you look up, up here, you'll see four again, and there it is again. Therefore, product ID number four identifies or determines just those pieces. So for now, the product ID 
determines only part of the key. Now, the order date depends on the order ID. And then we have this block, the customer information. This is actually technically a transitive dependency. So, but for now, what I'm gonna do, just to illustrate, is I'm gonna treat this all as one thing, and it is also dependent on the order ID. Okay, so for now, this is a partial dependency, but I'm gonna treat this as a single thing. Now, how do we fix this to get to second normal form? Well, that's actually pretty straightforward. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do for, for this? To give myself, at least so these don't get completely, mm, I've never tried doing this before. Hang on, new system. Yep, give me a second. This, okay, 50-50 chance I get the right one. Oh man, you know I should have done that earlier because I could have been drawing on that. Oh well, well, next time. Okay, there we go. So I just drew a brown line here so I can put in my second normal form. So our goal now is we want to get to two NF. So we get the second normal form by breaking things down into its component pieces that we've identified so far. So right now we've identified essentially three entities. You might not realize it yet, but we've identified three. The fully dependent one and the two partial dependencies. So one, two. So now we're going to go and create something called order, which has what am I writing? As order ID, product ID, quantity. Fantastic. We also identified two more things. So we got, um, actually, this is not order, this is order line, but let's go. So we have also the order is has the customer information in it so we go order which has again order id customer um actually has the order date order date customer id customer name customer address and we also have a product which has a product id uh product description and the product price like such and we know our identifiers like this. And now when we have these two that we identified and broke out earlier as our partial dependencies, we know that the product ID was a key and the order ID was a key. So as it currently stands, this entity is in third normal form. Why is it in third normal form? Because this depends on the key and the entire key. Basically, this one depends, uh, where's my green marker? Quantity depends on this and this. So basically the entire contents of it's in third normal form. It just end up being in third normal form right off the bat. And that's actually kind of common when you're going through the steps that some of the tables automatically go into third normal form because there's nothing else wrong with them. Therefore, they go straight to normal form. Our product at the bottom, also go straight to third normal form because the price and the description both rely on the product ID. So this one is also 
in third normal form. So now we're left with our happy or not so happy order table. So Uh, oh, it's n no, hang on. Can I, is it this? No, nope, not that. Best I can do is kind of put it up there. PowerPoint's limiting my zoom. Either I zoom in lots or I don't zoom in at all. Okay, so that's the data that's in there now. Um, there, there really isn't what happens if you skip a step. Either it happens or it doesn't. It, what, ha what I mean by you skip a step is you try to create database tables without going through all the steps. And then you have bad things. I don't have an example off the top of my head. Like I can't do it with this data set, for example. Like I can't show you what happens if you skip a step with this data set, because this data set is too simple. Okay, so right now we know that the customer ID is determined by the order, and the order date is also determined by the order ID. So if we look at the data that we had over here, you'll see that the customer ID and the order date is determined by the order ID. As it stands now, this table is not functional because we have you know, multiple pieces, so we already broke it out. So now the, the problem we have now is that the customer address and the customer's name depend on the customer ID. This is the transitive where order ID determines customer, Order ID, because it determines customer, also determines the customer. So it's transiting through this. So the, the piece of the, the symbol is if um, A determines B and B, de that's not B, that's D. B determines C, therefore A determines B. C. Shit. Yeah. Good. You're all paying attention. Apparently I was not. So that's the issue with a transitive. If A determines B and B determines C, therefore automatically A determines C. That's bad because, well, this isn't being respected. So we got to get rid of those. These are known as the good old transitives. like such. So how do we fix this? Well, I want to take a guess how you fix it. You break it into smaller pieces. Literally, that's all normalization is, is you take your stuff and you keep breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces until you get to the point where nothing interferes with anything else. So now I get to rewrite all of this on this board, except for the last two. So again, we are going to put in order. We've got the order ID, order date, and the customer ID. Now we get to actually have, you know, all the whole words now. Now we also have, um, we're going to create one called customer. We have customer ID, name, address. We have the order line, which has the order ID, the product ID, 
and the quantity. And the last one we have is the product, which has the product ID, description, the finish, and the price. And let me grab my blue marker. There are, well, we now have four entities. There's fourth normal form. Um, there's voice cod, there's fourth, fifth, DKNF, sixth, seventh, and eighth normal forms. Now there's no way that this data doesn't do those examples. We're not even teaching those, those levels in this course. This is uh, when you start dealing with fourth, fifth, and higher normal forms, that's like level four university, level three university. You don't see that until you're taking data science. That's not data science. <laughs> so in the end, we also have, um, I need, so right now, once we've done this, we know that we just so happen to have some foreign keys in there too, right? So and I'm gonna finish putting my colors up over here. So blue is our primary key. Also known as our identifier. Also known as our determinant. not writing this in Spanish. And we have our foreign keys. Okay. So we went from this mess of a table that we had on the screen here into these four entities. Now, these four entities are now, this is all officially in third normal form. So this whole thing is three and F because we know that everything is the term depending on the primary key. Yes. Yes. There must be no function. There must be no partial dependencies. What we have in orange here. And there must be no transitive dependencies which is what I've got in this plum color here. The first normal form, there are no repeating groups of rows, which is, hang on. Okay. I can write here, great, screen's up. the worst marker to use for this example. Let's try a different color that might actually have ink in it. There we go. We have repeat because this block belongs to this and this block belongs to that. This is not first normal form. First normal form, yeah, well, that's what's happening is there's like three chunks of information tied to one customer or to one order ID. So for first normal form, there are no repeating groups of columns anymore because now we've, instead of being this piece depending on that, all one piece and this is all one piece okay so that means there's no more repeating groups of columns because now they're full rows instead the primary key is defined and each of the columns values are atomic in other words there isn't two different values in here 
There's only one. So that's first normal form. Uh, pardon? Yeah, it's it's basically you got to make sure that the entire table is filled out from edge to edge, so that the primary, so that the combination of columns can find it. So the way it was set up before, right here, you can't find this because we don't have the order ID that goes with it. Even though it's listed above, it's just a visual thing. Right, the human brain understands it. Computers are stupid. Like computers are pretty dumb. Because it doesn't understand what that means. It's a visual thing, right? Because the human brains are really good at filling in the blanks. We see a blank, but then we see stuff to the right, and our brains say, ah, okay, that all belongs to this one up here because, you know, it's all repeating because, again, there's another break and it continues. So that's first normal form is that we identified the primary key. We filled in all the columns. The values are atomic. That's it. Okay. So now the partial dependencies is when part of the data, like the, the sum, sum of attributes only determined are determined by part of the key. So remember earlier the conversation about the determinant? So the product description, finish, and price is determined by the product ID. It has nothing to do with the order ID. Therefore, this is a partial dependency. These three attributes only depend or are basically identified or determined depending which phrase you want to use, by only part of the primary key. There you go. You got it. So this eventually will become a primary key. So we know that these three columns deter is determined by our determined by us. Therefore, it's a partial dependency. We take it, we break it out to its own entity, which we did here. We got the order. And the product. So that product over there became this. Fantastic. And get rid of them, and that, and you take partials, turn them into their own entity. Now we're in second normal form. Then we gotta to want to get rid of transitives. So customer name is determined by the customer ID. Customer ID currently is being determined by the order ID because the customer ID is not needed as a primary key. Right? In this structure, we're able to pull out every unique row regardless of the customer. Therefore, customer name is determined by customer ID. Customer ID is determined by order ID. How do you fix that? Because that when you look at the data, any given row can be uniquely identified by the combination of the order ID and the product ID when we first started. Like when you look at that little table, even though the writing is really small, The combination of this and this lets me pull out this row. The combination of this and this lets me pull out this row. In theory, I could have turned around and used the customer ID instead. But then it would have been this plus this, and then the transitive would have been the order ID. So regardless of which one you pick, there would have been a transitive because that's literally how this example was set up. The when you to create your your identifiers or your primary keys when you know at step one is the goal is to use the least number of attributes to determine your primary key so we could theoretically identify each row by two attributes either the customer id or the product id however here's where the problem is what happens if the customer places a second order the customer ID is no longer identifying the order, is it? Because now we're going to have duplicates of customer ID two orders, product ID seven a second time. So a month later, he sold, they sold both of the dining room tables they ordered. So now they need another two dining room tables to be brought in. That's why the order ID is part of the determinant, the, the identify the, the key, because the order ID will change with every order. The customer ID may not. Therefore, at this point, the customer ID is determining the customer's name and address, but it has nothing to do with determining the rest of the order. Therefore, because this, these two depends on this, and this depends on this, it's a transitive. Well, it's kind of like a partial dependency, 
But a partial dependency is when an attribute determ determ depends on only part of the key. A transitive dependency is when an attribute depends on another attribute that depends on the key. Right? So a partial dependency is when an attribute depends on only part of the key. A transitive dependency is when an attribute depends on an other attribute that is not part of the key. Uh, this went right off the top. Okay, let's see. See about scrolling this down a bit. There we go. Okay, I wish I could get the whole thing on here, but I can't. All right, so essentially what's happening is we can pick out every order based on these two things, right? That, that much we know. That, that first one here. We've already broken it down. So that we know that the name of the customer depends on the customer ID. The customer ID, on the other hand, depends on the order ID. The customer ID is not part of the the, uh, the primary key. Therefore, this transitive, in other words, order ID determines customer ID, customer ID, right? So you have to take this, break it into its own entity, which now brings you to the third normal form. I will, I can, uh, when I post it tonight, I'll post the, these two slides. Next week, I'll be doing another example. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because each you, a customer can place multiple orders. Therefore, it cannot be the primary key. It's just this sample data. Remember earlier, I was talking about depending on how much data you're given, you might not know all the facts. That's the situation where we don't know for a fact that the customer would place a second order. Obviously, it makes sense. Anybody here ever only ever placed one order on Amazon? No. That, that like, it, you know, it's pretty bad when the Amazon guy recognizes you. And you open the door and go, hey, how's it going today? He goes, pretty good. That's the third time this week I've seen you. And I wish I was joking. There's three people that live in my house that order from Amazon. Nobody talks to anybody else. <laughs> All right. All right, so that is essentially, you know, all that all that terminology I had at the first part of the lecture today, summarized in pictures right here. Okay, unfortunately, the screen recording, like when I'm recording here, the board won't have what I was drawing over here, just so you guys know. So for those that weren't here, you missed like the biggest explanation, but that's okay. Okay, go ahead. Here, let me move out of the way and you can take as many pictures as you want. Even better, let me pull out my phone and I'll take some pictures. And then I'll post them tonight. Yes, that's the goal. Okay, that was fun. Okay, now to go back to where we were earlier when I said I'm going to stop here because what I'm most worried about for this is that you guys understand partial and transitive dependencies. That was the, the takeaway for today. Yes, there's going to be a few questions on the midterm about voice COD, but the number of slides to number of questions is very disproportionate. In other words, there's going to be like eight slides and like one question, maybe two. I don't remember off the top of my head. I have a copy of last term's exam. And uh, knowing the course lead, it's not going to change very much. So if I remember, I think there was one or two questions of voice, voice, voice COD. And it was more about the definition than the actual practical. Okay. So a relation is known to be in voice COD. If and only if it's in third normal form, obviously, 
because it's the next normal form after third. And every determinant is a candidate key. So I've got an example up on the screen. Yes, it's small as can be, and I'm going to zoom in to make it a little easier to understand, to see. Oh, and this one works pretty good. There we go. Okay. So we have this table. And you'll notice that there's a SKU, a department, a buyer, and a SKU description. So we're going to, first things first, we're going to put the SKU data into first normal form. So we are going to decide that the SKU data, so this whole table is called SKU data. So it's got SKU, description, department, and buyer. So according to the first normal normalization rules, this table is in first NF. We can identify any given row based on a combination of the columns. Uh, specifically in this case would be very likely just the SKU. So to go in second normal form, we are going to break it down into three different pieces. We've got the SKU determines the description, the department, and the buyer. The description determines this is determined by determines the SKU department and the buyer, and the buyer determines the department. So, so what's happened here is that this table has two different Canada keys. So we could theoretically go both the SKU and the description could be used as identifiers. So a relation is in second normal form if and only if it's in first normal form and all the non-key attributes are determined by the primary key. Since SKU is a single column primary key, all non-key attributes are determined by the SKU. Therefore, technically, this is in second normal form. So if we say SKU is the primary key, everything else that depends on it so far, it's good. Nothing too weird there. So to get into third normal form, the SKU and the SKU descriptions are candidate keys. The relations in third normal form, only if it's in second, and there are no non-key attributes determined by another non-key attribute. In other words, there's none of these uh, plum-colored jobs, the transitive dependencies. Right now, we do have a transitive dependency. So to come back to the terminology, a non-key attribute means it's an attribute that is neither the candidate key or part of a composite key. So in other words, it's an attribute that is not part of the key. Just like when we looked at our example over here, the customer name is an attribute that's not part of the key. The customer ID was also an attribute, not part of the key. Yeah, that's what I know, but they are. They're dependencies, but they're different kinds of dependencies. It's like going to the dentist and they go, it's a tooth. We're going to pull out a tooth. Which tooth is it? There's words for every one of those teeth in your mouth. I guarantee it. The words have meaning. They have purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go back to another doctor example. You need to get your... Um, Holy crap, I can't remember the word. All right, you need to get your gallbladder removed. Step one, rip out the gallbladder. No, step one is you cut the person open. No, step one's putting them to sleep first. There's steps and stages, and each of those stages have names. That's what this is. Normalization has stages. It has definitions that go with each of the stages. Just because it's computer and it's ephemeral, because it's not physically real in the world doesn't mean that there's not words to describe it. Yes. Yes, that's all the normalization is. Voice cod, third, fourth, fifth, DKNF, it's all more of that. It's just there's definitions to describe the different kind of issues. All right. So the only non-key attribute we have is the buyer. 
and it's a determinant of the department. Therefore, this is non third normal form. So we'll end up with two different entities. We got the SKU data and the buyer. So the buyer, the SKU determines the description and the buyer. The buyer entity also describes the department. So these are now both in third normal form. This is where we start having problems. So if the SKU data as described earlier, we had, um, the problem is that the buyer must exist in SKU data too. The SKU description depends on the SKU, SKU, but the SKU description can also, so this is the case where the SKU could determine these three or the description could determine those three. Based on how the data was set up originally, either of those, let me go turn off the, that light, hang on, because it's really bleaching the screen. Okay, that's better. So if you look at these two, ignore the bottom one because we know the term, the buyer determines the department. Cool, we don't need to worry about that one. Let's ignore the last one. It's these two. You'll notice that the SKU can determine the description or the description can determine the SKU. So we have a chicken before the egg situation here where we don't know which one is which. Voice COD's purpose is to avoid those kinds of situations where you have potentially two different candidate keys. And you have to decide which one's gonna do which. So currently, if we look at our data and we broke it down back into the tables, for everybody's viewing enjoyment. So here's our SKU data before we, after we broke it out. So the SKU could determine the description of the buyer or the description could determine the SKU and the buyer. Currently right now, we have a bit of an um, uncertainty. Let's go with that phrase. We're not sure which one is the true candidate keys. So, and then we know that our buyer is, is good, right? So we got, Four buyers, four departments. We've got each SKU has a buyer. So basically, because we know the buyer, we know the department. Good. So there's something called going straight to Boyce COD. So by doing straight to Boyce COD is we go SKU becomes the description. and the So we know that this is what we had earlier. So we could theoretically, um, if you break out buyer to department, it takes up the functional dependency. And we end up with this, right? So we already did that. We kind of figured that out already. And now we're there. So the other thing is we the other thing we could do is one of the basics, basic solutions is you end up deciding which one is the key. So that's one of the two things about voice caught is you either make a hard decision, you say, the SKU is the primary key, end of story. We stop arguing about it. Now it's in Boyce COD. Because up till this point, we had a bit of an unknown which one was which. Um, I do have another example for Boyce COD that's actually a little easier to understand. Um, and I will grab those slides for your guys' enjoyment. funny because I taught this exact stuff last week. Hang on. Why you no load? Because it's a different course where I literally taught the exact same thing last week. But they have different slides. But you can see that the example is similar because those examples came from the same textbook. Not textbook you guys have. It's a really old test textbook we don't use anymore. Okay. So here's our situation. Are this table here, and I can zoom in. So this table technically is in third normal form. We have a primary key. There's no partial dependencies. There's no transitive dependencies. So if we look at the functional dependencies, you'll see that the Student ID in the major determines advisor and the major's GPA. The advisor is determined by the major. So suddenly we got a situation where even though it is in third normal form, it's not a good third normal form. So when we break it down, 
And we end up with something set up like this, which let me zoom in again. So if we were going to take this and break it down so at least it's, you know, much cleaner. So you have the student ID and the advisor determines the major's GPA. The advisor determines the, G, the major. Okay. So if we want to look at the data, it'll look like this. These two identify this. This one identifies that. Pretty clear, simple example. Now, the problem we have is um, because when we went from this and we broke it into two separate pieces, then it became Boyce Cod. Up here, originally, this was in third normal form, but not Boyce Cod because the advisor determined something else. Like it's basically a sub dependency. And this is saying that the attributes must depend on the, the key and the entire key. And because this one didn't depend on the entire key, it was not in voice cod. So the combination of these two determines both of these. However, part of the key could also determine this. So the situation with voice cod is it resolves is when one of the attributes could be determined by only part of the primary key, but it is also technically dependent on the entire primary key. So you fix that by literally, as you're breaking it out to separate pieces, into smaller pieces. And the, the thing is, is why would you or why would you not? Um, if I go back to my sample data over here, and suddenly we end up changing our uh, advisor, we'd have to change the advisor in two places. Here, we just change the, the advisor, you could change the, if you could turn it around theoretically, instead of using the advisor, you could also use the major instead. You could flip flop it. You just, whenever this example was being written, somebody decided this is the way we're going. Theoretically, you could go either way. Yeah, or what happens if you have two different advisors for physics? Usually in university, most advisors don't cover different disciplines, right? You're not going to have an advisor that teaches psychology also advising in the physics department. That's just not how that works. But in theory, you could have two physics professors doing physics. So this is what this situation resolves. Okay. So that brings us to, to the end of today. Yes, normalization is painful. Um, what's, like I said earlier, next week, what I'm going to do is I will be doing another example similar to this. I'll do a quick review because I'm waiting to hear back exactly what's on the midterm. I just want to make sure I don't forget anything. I'll do a quick review and then I'll do another one of these. So that with different data and different examples, so that you guys see it working at a different set of information. Outside of that, that's it, guys. Have a good one.